Welcome Color of Success podcast family. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie J. Wong. Check out my memoir, Cancel the Filter, Realities of a Psychologist, Podcaster, and Working Mother of Color, where I share my experiences in the realm of mental health, both professionally and personally. Color of Success podcast is streaming on all your favorite platforms and socials. Whether you're on the go or comfy on the sofa, you can tune in at your own comfort. As you know, we love growing discussions with our guests from our AAPI and ethnic minority communities. With so many friends and experts from different aspects of life, we love learning their stories and understanding what their success means to them. Let's get into it. Born to immigrants in Monterey Park, California, Justinian Wang studied English at Pomona College and screenwriting at Oxford. He now lives in Los Angeles with Swagger, a Shanghainese rescue dog he adopted during his five years living in China. The Emperor and the Endless Palace is his debut novel. Before becoming a novelist, Wang was a career film executive, most currently as the VP of Creative at Sony Pictures Animation. Prior to Sony, Wang was the head of development at DreamWorks Pearl in Shanghai, where he worked on Kung Fu Panda 3, Abominable, and Academy Award nominated Over the Moon. Well, Justinian, thank you so much for joining me on the Color Success podcast today. Thanks, Dr. Wong. How are you? I'm good. I am so excited to dive into all the things that went into writing a book, which I know is really, really hard. So (laughs) right off the bat, we dive deep into these characters that highlight intersectionality of culture, um, social class, sexuality. What went into the character and story development for you? Wow. Um, so to to start from the very beginning, right, which is that um, I am a queer person um, and I'm I'm of Asian descent. So uh, just just to exist is to be intersectional, right? Yes. <laughs> just, um, just, to be, just to live, yeah, just to <laughs> yes. live my life authentically yeah. is to be intersectional. Um, you know, when I was when I was very young, when I was in my early twenties, and I came out to my family. Um, they told me, at least some people in my family told me, like, the, that's not a thing. You can't, there's no such thing as gay Asian people. So you don't worry. That's not, that's actually not an issue. And then uh, that gave me, that obviously brought me a lot of um, turmoil and shame because I'm very proud of my heritage as an Asian person, as a person whose parents were born in Taiwan and whose ancestors are from China. You know, I, I, I have a lot of pride in my cultural heritage. So when I first heard about this true story about this emperor, this Chinese emperor who in 4 BCE ruled over the Han dynasty, lived in a palace that was called the Endless Palace and fell in love with one of the men in his court and fell so deeply in love with this boy that he handed his whole kingdom to this boy. Um, I just thought, wow, this is like such an epic love story. I'd stumbled upon a great love story that most people don't know. And I just wanted to write it, you know, like, obviously, I was attracted to it because the main characters were queer Asian men like myself. But I also just think the thing about writing romance and love stories is that it's a basic human need to love and to be loved. So you're really tapping into something that is not specific. It's it's as general as it's universal. uh, It's universal. Exactly. And then it becomes multifaceted, right? At the same time, there aren't enough, there aren't enough love stories in the um, Western arena that star Asian people. And there's even less stories in the Western arena that star queer Asian people. Uh, my my whole thing when I set out to write this book was that I wanted to be very culturally specific. Mm-hmm. There's, um, one of my mentors is David Henry Huang, who wrote who wrote M Butterfly and has mm-hmm. been a very prolific screenwriter and um, playwright ever since. And he told me something like about ten years ago that has always resonated with me, which was that the more culturally specific you get, the more lovingly specific you get in a story ironically, the more universal the story becomes. So using that as sort of my mantra, I was I just said, I'm going to write my truth in this. And hopefully that resonates with not just people who are queer and Asian like myself. And sure enough, you know, I'm the book has been out now 
almost two months. And the feedback I get from people who have really responded to the book is from people from all walks of life, all cultural backgrounds, a spectrum of sexualities and genders and other identifiers. So, um, so it's been very gratifying for sure. Well, what I love about it is right when I cracked it open for media use only people that (laughs) you really dive deep into those aspects that you just talked about, but also it's spicy, you guys, Mm -hmm. like it is spicy. So I think that that is really cool about it because you're just opening up all this dialogue about what it means to have your first sexual encounter, to start to think about what does this really mean for my family, for me, because it's so tied into um, the reputations that we have. And that's even to this day, like you said, like your family had a, a reaction when I, when my mom and I had a discussion about my uncle coming out or rather not coming out, I saw some pictures on his wall and I said, Hey, mom is uncle so-and-so gay. She's like, yes, good night. Lights out, <laughs> close the door. Um, and I love my uncle. Right. And, and right. just like, we have so much fun together, but it was like, that was the extent where we had a conversation. Right. So even to this day, yeah. those things happen. Yeah. Uh, thank you for like, you know, bringing up the spiciness of it all. Um, so as my book was getting published, this idea of books being spicy, being very trendy was like, sort of like, you know, at the forefront of the zeitgeist. When I set out to write this book, um, which was almost 10 years ago, like this concept of spicy books wasn't a thing yet. I mean, there's always been erotica in books, sure, sure, sure. but now it's like the youth want the spice. You're Gen Z <laughs> yes. kids are talking about spice, you know? Um, I didn't realize this would become a trend. The reason why I wanted to write, um, I wanted to, my characters to have like a lot of erotic truth to them. And I wanted to write Asian men that were very swaggering and sexually yes. confident is because one, that's just my truth. That's just what I know. I've, I've dated many Asian men who, who just, who are like that. So, and then like, I, I, you need to write what you know, and I know spicy Asian men, but also <laughs> because, also because like, I think it's a shame that, you know, like I grew up with Asian men being depicted in ways that, you know, were nerdy or sort of, sort of desexualized or whatever. I know that there's, I know that with my straight brothers, right, in the Asian community, they sometimes have qualms about Asian men being de- being depicted as queer because they feel as though it further pushes the agenda that, you know, Asian men are more are depicted as more feminine or whatever. But, you know, I, I think it's 2024 and queer Asian men uh, like uh, that doesn't that doesn't take away from our maleness that. Yeah that were depicted as as queer i always like to say that actually the um there's nothing more manly than being gay because you only are dealing with other men so. <laughs> that's a good point that's gonna be a tag yeah. and, and you know and 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 my characters are swaggering and they have and yes. and they are very comfortable in their sexualities and and you know like it's 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 i'm just trying to I'm just I'm just trying to show another facet to Asian masculinity, you know, and it's been fun to explore for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you worked on a lot of amazing product uh, projects in animation, you know, Kung Fu Panda 3, Over the Moon, which I was the first I have daughters, but I was like, nope, that Chung Ah doll, that first one is mine uh, with the, you know, with the wonderful dress and all that. Yeah. How does working on movies like that really shape your approach to writing and representation? So, you know, like, obviously people were like, wow, you come from family entertainment and you wrote wrote this very spicy romantic book. Right. I actually think that um, what feature animation taught me was that when feature anime movies are incredibly expensive to make, like, yes, especially from my era, like from like the, the mid 20 teens, they were, they they were minimum a hundred million dollars. Right. Especially when you're dealing with DreamWorks films. Yes. Um, And because of that, uh, we always were taught to look for big hooks, right? What is a hook? A hook is a concept, just like the, the, uh, what the, a concept about a film that hooks the largest audience possible, right? Like for instance, Kung Fu Panda 3, which you, or Kung Fu Panda just in general, the franchise has one yeah. of the greatest hooks I think of all time, which is that this adorable, lovable, chubby panda 
finds out that he is meant to be the great Kung Fu warrior of his yeah. time, right? Like what a great, like that is a hook that instantly, you know, you can capture a big yes. audience. So I think what, what being a film exec in animation taught me when it came to formulating my own book was that when I was telling people, I want to write a love story between queer Asian people, I was told often, wow, that sounds so niche. And first of all, there's hundreds of millions of queer Asian people in the world, just by just by statistically speaking. So we're like probably one of the biggest quiet mind, like the, one of the biggest marketplaces that people don't really cater to yet in the West. So that's my first thought. So we're actually not niche. But then my second thought was, well, I'm going to find the biggest hooks possible so that it doesn't matter whether you look or identify like someone like me, or if you're, you know, a soccer mom in Ohio, you know, like I, I wanted to write something yes. that, that, that people even just by hearing the concept, they'd be like, oh, that sounds like something that's very interesting. So first was finding this real life couple, this emperor and his lover. And then the second thing was finding a way to sort of make them feel relevant and timely. And that's when that's when I came across this idea of what if I just reincarnate them over and over again, which is a trope that's rather new in American literature, but is a very like well-worn trope in Asian entertainment. I mean, you have a lot of reincarnation love stories, oh, yeah. dramas and stuff. So, um, so it, it was really me just like, it was really just me taking the concepts of my background and repackaging them in a way that would be fun for a Western audience. Well, you know, we are a mental health podcast. So I said, ah, you know, I'm not going into any mental health psychosocial history here. But I was wondering, writing yeah. this book, was there a cathartic or a therapeutic aspect of the approach, but also even putting it out in the world? For sure. I mean, like, you know, um, I think like most people, I've been touched by people who have mental health struggles, for sure. People who are very close to me. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with um, the Asian American experience of growing up in, um, uh, growing up in this country, you know, where you have to you have to straddle you have to straddle like multiple worlds. Like, I remember always thinking like I come home to like a different world. You know, I, I go to my high school where a lot of my friends were, you know, Orange County white kids. But then I would go home to a family with completely different values than what I was the, the, then the world that I, you know, then, then my peers basically. Right. So that created the, it, you just like, when you're a child of immigrants beyond just like, oh my gosh, you have all this pressure on you to succeed because your parents uprooted their lives to like, give you a better one. You're also constantly being torn apart. You know, you're always, you're constantly being like, you're constantly code switching. You're constantly feeling, um, like uh like you're constantly feeling like no matter what you do you're always going to be another including to your including to your own parents you know yeah. so that's something that i definitely that's that's why one of my so in my book you have three timelines right one one of which is the original endless palace timeline but i also have a timeline that takes place in present day la which is another incarnation of our lovers and the the main the narrator of this timeline is a boy who was born in Taiwan, but was raised in LA. And he does talk about, and he's raised Christian, no, no less, you know? So he talks about the, the push and pull and how he feels like a misfit, that he doesn't feel, that he doesn't fit in, that he he's, talk, he's constantly talking about whether he belongs in a certain situation. He's always talking like, he, when, he, when he, he sometimes will run away from a situation and he'll literally say, I don't belong here. But then you realize that this boy never quite feels like he belongs. And um, and the reason why, of course, is one of the big twists of the book, so. Which we will not spoil. So, yeah, we, we're not, yeah, we won't spoil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote my book, Cancel the Filter. And what that's about is really, yeah. looking at social media and what we put out there is yeah. not necessarily capturing a person's full reality. So I've been asking a lot of my guests, what are some cancel the filter moments that you've experienced? Social media has been an interesting thing for me. You know, before I, before I wrote this book, I had a private Instagram account that had like a thousand followers maybe. Now, since I started my publishing journey, I opened it up and 
you know, um, I think I'm approaching 9,000 followers now. And then what's interesting is that those, those 8,000 followers that have been people following me because of my book journey, you know? So, um, so, so it, which is, which is very interesting, but at the same time, the children call it being perceived. I actually am, I actually am a rather shy person. Um, and sometimes I don't like to be perceived, I go through moments when I I I, I do feel sadness. Like I I have I have people in my family right now who are going through um like like the, who are going through health journeys that are mm-hmm. very difficult to follow that and and you know like you wonder how much you want to share of that experience. You know like uh, uh, my publisher tells me it's good for an author to be open about those things, but I also feel I also feel this a little bit of a pressure to be to to try to present a more aspirational aspect because there is a lot of joy in my life and I do feel very blessed to be given the platform that I've been given you know something that I I said that people from all walks of life reach out to me and talk to me now but the very special people that come talk, talk to me are like queer Asian men who tell me they feel very seen by what I'm doing and um I just want I, whenever I whenever I do do something that's like outward facing, like posting on my Instagram. I try to be mindful of folks like that who, you know, um, potentially have like a parasocial sort of way of looking at, uh, like, because I do it too. Like the people that I admire, I I imagine them as like being like my friend, right? So it's just stuff that I'm slowly story. I'm sort of I'm sort of slowly getting used to it, and um, it's it's been an, it's it's been kind of interesting for sure. Well, it's not always comfortable. And, you know, one thing that I will say is you just existing being is inspirational, aspirational, right? And I think, you know, I'm a huge BTS fan. You see the pillow in the background, but that, yeah. that's exactly the meaning, oh, right? <laughs> that's yeah. their their message is like, just by existing, we're fighting xenophobia. And yeah. so uh, I think that's you're doing so many amazing things. So I guess I wanted to wrap up the interview with what are you hoping people take away from your novel and where can folks get a copy of this amazing book? You know, the the book, because it does play with this intersectionality, it's, it's very, com- usually people, when they finish it, they are like, I need to wrap my head around it before I talk to you more about it. I just, you know, I, I, I'm so proud that my book is one of the first big five published books to to feature an all queer Asian romantic leads. I'm very proud of that. But most importantly is I just want, as a writer, as a creator, as a storyteller, I just want my books to have, like, I just want people to feel something. You know, I feel like we live in this world that's so manufactured now. And then we spend our lives staring at screens and um, and everything is so curated, right? And then, and then you, you I, I think it's so important that even if you're yelling at my book because it's, it's infuriating you, or if my book pulls you to a place that might be kind of sad, or if it sweeps you off your feet, hopefully, like, all I want is for my book to make you feel something mm. true, to give you a true feeling. That's my ultimate, that's my ultimate goal as a storyteller. Um, and if I can, if I can help you reshape the way you think about love, because I think often the way we think about love is not really genuine to who we are individually. Like we have these concepts of love that are like shaped by like fairy tales or Hollywood, but they're not actually true to what we need as individuals. If I can help you reshape your own definition of love, uh, the love that's best and healthiest for you, then I think that's a really cool thing to do as well. And my book, The Emperor and the Endless Palace, it's available pretty much anywhere. You can just Google it and um, or Google my name. And, um, I, you know, uh, uh, websites like bookshop.org help out um, independent um, books, booksellers. And it's also available as an audiobook. It's um, because it's sold in three different timelines. There's three different narrators, all three of whom are oh, wow, that's awesome. incredibly talented AAPI actors who do a, a smash up job of narrating some of the very spicy scenes. So be prepared, be prepared to blush a little bit while you're listening. I need to, to put in the earphones oh. uh, with oh, yes. the kids around for sure. Exactly. Oh, it is. They do a great job. I chose all three of them. Um, I handpicked all three of them because they all have very beautiful voices. And I was like, it will sound good when they read this scene. 
That's so. key to audiobooks. So Indeed. Justinian, thank you so much for spending your time with me. And you are just an amazing human being. Thank you, Dr. Wong. This, uh, thank you for having me on. You're my first podcast. This is really exciting. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm so honored. I'm honored. Are you kidding me? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening. We would love for you to subscribe to the podcast and join our community on all our socials at colorsuccesspodcast.com. Looking forward to you checking out my memoir, Cancel the Filter, Realities of a Psychologist, Podcaster, and Working Mother of Color on Amazon and wherever books are sold. I'd love to hear your Cancel the Filter moments.